step into the extraordinary universe of a man who didn't just live in his imagination, but shaped an entire world with it. Stan Lee, the god of the comic book realm, and universally recognized legend of Marvel. His life, much like the superheroes he created, is a saga of creativity, innovation, and boundless imagination. Today, we delve into the captivating journey of a man who revolutionized the comic book industry. Join us as we uncover 101 amazing facts about the legendary Stan Lee. Number one. Stan Lee wasn't always Stan Lee. Stan Lee was born as regular old Stanley Martin Lieber on December 28, 1922. It was much later in life that Stan Lee chose to adopt the pseudonym Stan Lee for what he considered his lesser works in the realm of comic books. His intention was to preserve his full name for the novels he aspired to publish in the future. You can even say that Stan Lee was sort of like his superhero name. Number 2. Initially, Stan Lee aspired to be a novelist rather than a comic book writer. His early career aspirations leaned toward traditional storytelling, but he eventually found immense success and left an indelible mark on popular culture through his groundbreaking work in the comic book industry. Number 3. But before we get too deep into the career of this Marvel legend, let's start at the beginning. Stan Lee was born to Jewish immigrants Celia Solomon and Jack Lieber, who fled Romania due to anti-Semitic policies. Number four, Stan's early years were spent in New York, specifically the great bustling borough of Manhattan, where his family would live in a small apartment and his father would work as a tailor. Number five, Celia and Jack Lieber's second son and Stan Lee's brother, Larry Lieber, was born during their time in Manhattan. Larry would be a key individual in Stan Lee's life, acting as a collaborator for several comic book heroes. Number six, Stan Lee cherished his bicycle as his best friend, attributing its dreamy feeling of wings and freedom to provide an escape from the challenges at home. The bike served as a means for the boy to fly both physically and imaginatively, offering respite from the difficulties with his father and distressed mother. Stan Lee expressed the desire to escape through childhood memories, including riding his bike through the streets of New York and imagining himself as a mighty knight. Number seven, books and movies were Stan Lee's significant hobbies with a particular fascination for cinematography, even though it was an infrequent pleasure due to financial constraints. Stan highlighted the scarcity of movie experiences in those days, mentioning that he could only afford to attend about one movie a month because of the cost, turning each visit into a significant event. Number eight, Stan's world of fantasies was enriched by his involvement in the theater group. The theater group provided a source of fun and allowed him to transform into different characters, serving as an additional means of escaping from reality. Number nine. Stan Lee's favorite actor during his childhood was Errol Flynn, known for playing characters with strong moral values. He adored Flynn for consistently playing heroic roles like an honest sheriff, Robin Hood, or Captain Blood. Number 10. Stan's theater experience, coupled with his admiration for Errol Flynn, influenced Lee's desire for his own characters to embody similar principles. His exposure to Shakespeare and biblical stories at the synagogue contributed to the development of these moral ideals in the characters he would later create. Number 11. By the time Stanley was in his teens, he would see his family move from Manhattan into the Bronx, where he continued to live in an apartment. Number 12. Despite a general disinterest in school, one person caught Stan's attention, Leon B. Ginsburg, a teacher just around 10 years older than him. Ginsburg left a lasting impression on Stan, with the teacher being so memorable that Lee later referenced him in his autobiographical book, Excelsior! The Amazing Life of Stan Lee. Number 13. Stan Lee acknowledged the transformative power of humor, stating that Mr. Ginsburg made him realize that learning could be fun and that humor was a more effective way to engage and convey information. Number 14. As Stan Lee advanced to DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, he continued to nurture his love for reading and began developing his own writing skills. At school, he joined the editorial staff of the literary magazine, but his true passion lay not in writing or editing, but in the entire publishing process, particularly the art of selling the publication to readers. Stanley declared himself an advertising director, showcasing innate talent that made it evident he had a gift for this aspect of the business. Number 15. Known for the charismatic and outrageous actions, Stanley demonstrated a purpose behind his eccentricities, always understanding the reasoning behind his actions and having a keen sense of his audience's needs and moods. Number 16. In a practical bid to support his family and earn pocket money, Stan explored various occupations, including writing obituaries, crafting press releases, delivering sandwiches, working as a ticket taker in a Broadway theater, and selling newspaper subscriptions. Number 17. In 1939, Stan Lee kicked off his career in his teenage years, landing his first job at the age of 16, working as an assistant at Timely Comics, which will later be known as Marvel Comics. Accounts vary on how he got the opportunity, though. Some say it's because his cousin's husband was the company's publisher. Others say it's because he answered a newspaper ad. Number 18. 
Stan, discontent with mundane tasks, embraced his passion for writing. Recognizing his literary talent, his boss assigned him to add text filler to the Captain America comic, marking Stan Lee's official debut as a writer under his pseudonym. This marked the transition from the boy Stan Lee to the author-writer Stan Lee. Number 19. Stan made his comic writing debut in Captain America No. 3, published in 1941. In it, he had the brilliant idea to make Captain America throw his shield, although he only did it through text at the time. Number 20. After Stan's successful work on the third issue, Martin Goodman, his boss, took notice. By the fifth issue, Stan Lee started taking on the role under his pseudonym, Real Nats, which, if you haven't already noticed, is Stan Lee backwards. Number 21. The young man helped create a hero called Destroyer. The publisher then asked him to make a brand new character, resulting in Jack Frost, the King of Cold. Number 22. Feeling undervalued at Timely Comics, Kirby and Simon, the author, artist, and co-creators of Captain America, agreed to work for DC Comics as well. This decision angered Martin Goodman, leading to the dismissal of both Kirby and Simon, who had recently introduced Stan Lee to their secret affairs. Number 23. Faced with the loss of both an author and an artist, as well as an editor-in-chief held by Simon, Martin Goodman turned to 18-year-old Stan Lee. Recognizing Lee's proven talent, business acumen, and organizational skills, Goodman appointed Stan Lee to be an interim editor of Timely Comics while he looked for a new editor. According to Stan, Goodman never found a replacement, so he ended up keeping the job. Number 24. Despite the perceived lack of prestige in comics, Stan held prestigious roles as the chief editor, art director, and main author at a young age. Stan had to fight for these titles using various pseudonyms like Stan Lee and Stan Martin to separate his roles in the editorial office. Number 25. Stan's true self emerged as a young man full of energy, unafraid of incorporating jokes and playful behavior in the workplace, often surprising the more serious adult part of the editorial office with antics like playing the ocarina and wearing strange hats. Stan's creativity knew no bounds, acting out characters, imitating sounds, and even using the desktop as a stage pretending to conduct an orchestra. Number 26. In 1942, Lee was enlisted and served in the war, but instead of fighting on the front lines, he contributed to the creation of army training films. Number 27. During his service, he was assigned to the Signal Corps initially, which is where Stan's self-promotion skills came into play. By highlighting his identity as a comic book editor and his artistic talents, the command recognized his potential and transferred him to the training film division. There, he created visual training materials for different military units. Number 28. During this time, a promise of employment was made, and upon his return, that promise was fulfilled with a position as editor-in-chief and later lead publisher. Number 29. At that time, the young man was just a little over 20 years old. Instead of going to college, Stan Lee worked all the time, dreaming of a fun and lively student life that he didn't get to experience. With the money earned both in Timely and in the army, Stan bought his first car, a Buick. Du, 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 du. Number 30. Despite having fresh ideas and ambitious plans, the enthusiasm was not met with success. Post-war, society's perspective shifted, and fictional superheroes no longer held the same attraction for readers. Sales continued to decline, leading to the demise of even beloved characters like Captain America, which ceased to exist in 1949. Number 31. Stan Lee's dissatisfaction with the restrictive comic industry resulted in him working on comics in a variety of genres, including westerns, romance, humor, and suspense. Number 32. In 1947, Stan Lee married Joan Clayton Bucock, the love of his life. Number 33. There are several versions of how Stan and Joan met. According to Stan, he once had a blind date, and when he went to pick the girl up, Joan answered the door. He thought she looked like his dream girl, so they went out, and he never went on a date with the other girl. Number 34. Stan and Joan were inseparable for 70 years perfectly complementing each other and actively participating in each other's lives. Beyond being Stan's partner, Joan had a career as a voice actress, contributing her talents to various animated series and bringing characters to life through her voice work. Number 35. This significant life event sparked a desire for change in Stan Lee. Inspired by these thoughts, he initiated a new project, the magazine Secrets Behind the Comics. Number 36. Stan's pamphlet was inspired by his article titled There's Money in Comics, published in the well-regarded Writer's Digest magazine. Writer's Digest was popular among the writing community and featured a cover with a portrait of the 25-year-old Stan Lee holding a pipe in his teeth. The article likely discussed financial opportunities in the comic industry, influencing Stan to delve further into the subject. Number 37. In 1950, another significant life event occurred for Stan Lee. Stan and Joan welcomed their daughter, Joan C. 
Cecilia into the world. Number 38. While not directly about Stan Lee, in the 1940s, comics introduced violent and explicit themes, sparking societal worries. This negative perception stigmatized comic artists, causing a decline in the medium's reputation. Psychiatrist Frederick Wortham fueled the backlash with his influential 1954 book, Seduction of the Innocent. Claiming comics turned teens into delinquents, public concern peaked, leading to a U.S. Senate investigation. To preempt consequences, publishers formed the American Association of Comic Publishers and created the Comics Code Authority in 1954. This aimed to self-regulate and address societal criticisms by controlling and censoring comic content. Number 39. Stan Lee encountered periods of contemplating leaving Marvel due to the industry restrictions and challenges. Frustrated by the constraints of the comic book industry, he almost parted ways with Marvel several times. However, his resilience and creative vision ultimately prevailed, leading to the creation of groundbreaking and iconic characters that transformed the comic book landscape. Number 40. Stan Lee's ambition and desire to create something unique and known by name set him apart in the comic industry, despite clashes with his boss Martin Goodman. In one interview, he said he wanted to to quit. I really wanted to quit and try something else. And I remember Jones said to me, you know, Stan, if you want to quit before you do, why don't you do one book the way you would like to do it? The worst that happens is Martin will fire you. And so what? You want to quit anyway. Number 41. Sparked by the success of DC Comics' Justice League of America, Martin Goodman approached Stan Lee with the assignment to compete with the Justice League. DC's group superhero concept was popular, prompting Goodman to order something similar from Stan Lee. Number 42. This was the chance for Stan to do it his way. In 1961, Lee and Kirby introduced the Fantastic Four with a unique approach, portraying them as ordinary people with superpowers facing everyday life circumstances. It was a record-breaking success. The innovative concept of the Fantastic Four captivated readers from the very beginning. Number 43. The success of the Fantastic Four required new superheroes to join the crew. Stan already had a plan. Inspired by the film Frankenstein and the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, his goal was to create a misunderstood monster portrayed as a fundamentally good character. He combined elements of both inspirations in the creation of the Hulk, co-created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Number 44. Following the trend of adding more and more superheroes, he was assigned with the task of creating another superhero. This time, he had to come up with something new. This time around, he wanted the hero to be an ordinary guy, teenager, someone readers could relate to. That's where he wrote the character of Peter Parker and his alter ego, Spider-Man. My personal favorite hero. I'm basic, I'm from New York, I like Spider-Man. Number 45. Stan Lee's inspiration for Spider-Man struck when observing a fly on the wall. The idea of a hero with the ability to stick to walls emerged from this simple observation, giving birth to the iconic character. Number 46. Before finalizing Spider-Man, Stan Lee contemplated names like Flyman and Mosquito Man. Ultimately, he chose Spider-Man for its dramatic and memorable resonance. Number 47. Stan Lee infused Spider-Man with personal problems, providing depth beyond the conventional superhero archetype. Spider-Man's uniqueness as a teenager defied the prevailing trend of adult superheroes during that era. Number 48. When Stan Lee initially pitched the idea of Spider-Man to Goodman at Marvel, he faced resistance. Goodman was skeptical about the concept of a hero with a spider-themed persona, believing that readers might find the idea of a wall-crawling, web-slinging character unappealing. Stan said in an interview, he gave me a thousand reasons why Spider-Man would never work. Nobody likes spiders, it sounds too much like Superman, and how could a teenager be a superhero? Stan Lee persisted, convinced that the uniqueness of Spider-Man's powers and the relatable character of Peter Parker would resonate with audiences. Number 49. Despite the initial rejection, Lee, along with the artist Steve Ditko, went on to create Spider-Man. Stan proposed a trial issue of Amazing Adult Fantasy, a series facing cancellation, featuring Spider-Man. The character made his debut in Amazing Fantasy No. 15 in 1962, and despite low expectations, the issue became an overwhelming success, prompting the publisher to launch Spider-Man as a series. Stan Lee's creativity and persistence turned a potentially overlooked character into a breakthrough for Marvel Comics. It not only proved the publisher's doubts wrong, but also established Spider-Man as one of the most beloved and enduring superheroes in comic book history. Number 50. Moving on to the offices at Marvel, the Marvel bullpen was a term coined by Stan Lee in the 60s for Marvel's creative team. This aimed to give equal recognition to all contributors, fostering collaboration and recognition among the team. Number 51. Stan Lee also initiated the bullpen bulletins as a newspaper, promoting direct communication with readers. Number 52. The bullpen bulletins featured a column called Stan's Soapbox. It was in this column where Stan used the famous catchphrase, Excelsior which went on to become a slogan associated with Stan Lee's brand. 
Number 53, Stan Lee's catchphrase Excelsior, meaning ever upward in Latin, evolved into his key to prominence that united millions of sincere followers of his Marvel fandom. Number 54, the 60s also saw Stan Lee introduce the creation of the Marvel No Prize to humorously acknowledge fans who identified continuity errors in the comics. Number 55, sometime during the early 60s, Stan Lee, along with Jack Kirby, introduced the Marvel method for writing comics and transformed comic book creation into a collaborative, efficient process. Instead of traditional scripted approaches, Stan started providing artists with a broad plot or brainstorming ideas with them. Artists then took the lead, visually interpreting the story in its entirety. Stan Lee added dialogue and captions afterward, showcasing his distinctive writing style. This method allowed for a faster production schedule, highlighted the strengths of each collaborator, and contributed to the dynamic storytelling that became a hallmark of Marvel Comics during the Silver Age. Number 56 in 1962, inspired by the success of his comic trend, Stan Lee, along with Jack Kirby and Larry Lieber, introduced the Norse god Thor to the Marvel Universe. Number 57. Larry Lieber took charge of writing the full script for Thor, influenced by Norse legends and Vikings imagery. Lee chose a hammer as Thor's weapon for its dramatic effect. Number 58. Fun fact, unlike Superman, Thor addressed the conventional portrayal of flying with no visible means of propulsion. Thor has a scientifically grounded approach to flight, which is swinging the hammer like a propeller. Number 59. Stan Lee wanted to explore different character dynamics, leading to the creation of Ant-Man with Kirby and Lieber in the same year. Ant-Man was a scientist capable of changing size and communicating with insects. Ant-Man the character actually appeared earlier in the year, however he wouldn't appear in costume until September of 1962. Number 60. Iron Man was created by Stan, Jack Kirby, Larry Lieber, Don Heck, and Art Simic. Larry scripted the debut, Stan acted as editor and story plotter, Jack Kirby designed the cover and character, Don Heck drew the story, and Art Simic did the lettering. Introduced in 1963, Iron Man reflected Lee's desire to make an initially unlikable character likable, and showcased Tony Stark's transformation after being captured in a war zone. Number 61 Stan Lee thought that people might not like Iron Man, which can be surprising since Iron Man is now a very popular superhero in the Marvel Universe. Even though the character is well loved, he wasn't sure if audiences would appreciate a superhero who's a rich weapons maker. Number 62. The same year, Lee and Kirby brought the debut of Professor X and the X-Men. Inspired by Lee's decision to create a superhero team without explicitly explaining the source of their superpowers. And honestly, I feel that. In my personal opinion, sometimes it's just better not to think too hard about the origins, as it, I feel like it spoils the fun and mystery, but that might just be me. Number 63. In 1963, Doctor Strange was introduced, featuring Doctor Stephen Strange's transformation from an arrogant neurosurgeon to a powerful sorcerer after losing the use of his hands in a car accident. Steve Ditko contributed to the character's initial idea and sketches, with Stan Lee enhancing the concept, resulting in the creation of Doctor Strange. Number 64. In 1964, Daredevil, created by Stan Lee and Bill Everett, featured lawyer Matt Murdock with heightened senses, adding a unique twist to a superhero archetype. Number 65. Black Panther, created in 1966, is T'Challa, the King of Wakanda. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby initially disputed authorship, but eventually agreed on co-creation. Number 66. The Black Panther became the first mainstream African-American superhero. Lee's creation marked a significant step towards diversity and representation in comics, contributing to a more inclusive and culturally rich superhero landscape. Number 67. Lee's motivation for creating Black Panther wasn't rooted in civil rights, but rather a realization about the absence of black superheroes, demonstrating Lee's commitment to inclusivity. Number 68. Other characters introduced in the 1960s, like Nick Fury, Hawkeye, Black Widow, Scarlet Witch, The Silver Surfer, and Falcon, became integral parts of Marvel's superhero universe. Number 69. Knock knock! The Nixon administration's here, ready to recruit some superheroes. Stan Lee was asked by the US government to create anti-drug storylines to help the administration fight its war on drugs. Number 70. This was the perfect setup for Stan Lee to challenge the Comics Code Authority in 1971. Marvel tried to get approval, but the Comics Code Authority wouldn't budge at all when it came to storylines featuring drugs. So, with Martin Goodman's blessing, Stan Lee published his drug-related storyline in Spider-Man without the Comics Code Authority seal of approval. This story broke traditional boundaries and paved the way for more socially relevant comic narratives. Number 71. In 1972, Stan Lee received a promotion and became the editorial director and publisher of Marvel Comics. 
Subsequently, he stopped writing monthly comics to focus on his publisher duties. Number 72. Stan Lee made his first official San Diego Comic-Con debut in 1975, where he was listed as an official guest. From 1975 onward, Stan would attend SDCC frequently, meeting and spending time with fans. Number 73. In 1977, Stan Lee collaborated with artist John Romita Sr. to launch the Amazing Spider-Man daily comic strip, expanding everyone's friendly neighborhood Spider-Man's reach beyond comic and into newspapers. Number 74. Further going beyond just comics and into Japan, Spider-Man received a Japanese live-action tokusatsu superhero TV show produced by Toei. Instead of Peter Parker, Toei's version of the character was Takuya Yamashiro. Even though the character wore a similar costume as the original Spider-Man, several aspects of the show, such as the origin story and powers, differed. Despite this, Stan Lee praised the show. Number 75. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby co-created one of the first graphic novels, The Silver Surfer, The Ultimate Cosmic Experience, in 1978. Number 76. In 1980, Lee and illustrator John Buscema introduced She-Hulk, a female character with Hulk-like powers, further adding diversity into Marvel's superhero lineup. Number 77. Marvel opened up an animation studio on the West Coast. To help develop these shows, Stan Lee made the decision to move to Los Angeles in the early 80s. Number 78. In 1981, the first of many projects by the new animation studio aired, with Spider-Man. This was followed by Spider-Man and his amazing friends, as well as The Incredible Hulk in 1982. Number 79. As with what comes with age, Stan Lee started wearing toupees to conceal his balding, creating the image of a youthful Uncle Lee. The collection of toupees allows him to give the illusion that his hair was growing by changing them gradually. Number 80. In 1989, Stan Lee made his first live-action cameo appearance in the Trial of the Incredible Hulk television movie. This would be the first of many Stan Lee on-screen cameo appearances. Number 81. Despite his diverse roles at Marvel, including briefly serving as the company's president, Lee ultimately stepped down to concentrate on creative endeavors. However, he remained as chairman emeritus. Number 82. Stan Lee ventured into independent projects, founding Stan Lee Media and Power Entertainment and authored autobiographical books like Excelsior, The Amazing Life of Stan Lee. Number 83. Stan Lee received numerous awards throughout his life in acknowledgement of his impact on the comic book industry and popular culture. The Will Eisner Award Hall of Fame and the Jack Kirby Hall of Fame, to name a few. Number 84. Blade, which was released in theaters on August 19, 1998, was to be the first theatrical film cameo appearance for Stan Lee. However, this appearance was cut. Get it? Cut? Because it's Blade? Um, I'll see myself out now. Number 85. Around the early 2000s, he introduced the Just Imagine series at DC, offering his unique take on iconic heroes like Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Green Lantern, and The Flash. In an interview, Stan Lee shared that DC Comics approached him with a unique project. What if Stan Lee created the DC Universe? They requested him to reimagine characters like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, and more. Stanley agreed and had fun transforming them. For instance, he turned Batman into a black man and changed Flash into a female. He expressed enjoyment in the creative process. Number 86. In the early 2000s, Marvel characters created by Stan Lee became the focus of Hollywood blockbusters like X-Men, Spider-Man, Daredevil, and Fantastic Four. Number 87. In 2008, President George W. Bush awarded Stan Lee with the National Medal of Arts. Number 88. Hollywood honored Stan Lee with a star on the Walk of Fame in 2011, recognizing his significant contribution to modern culture and further solidifying his impact in the world of comics and pop culture. Number 89. According to Stan Lee, devoted fans and active contributors who passionately embrace the Marvel Universe, co-authoring its narrative with their enthusiasm and engagement are the true believers. Number 90. Stan Lee's dark glasses served a practical purpose and didn't just look good. Over the years, he developed eye problems. Stan Lee turned a practical necessity, wearing glasses due to eye problems, into a symbol. Number 91. When asked about the glasses, he said, I've always worn sunglasses. They're like my mask, I guess. It was probably just some silly affectation. When I was very young and just started off as a writer, I always lit a pipe and held it in my teeth as I wrote. I hated smoking a pipe, but I felt it made me look older and like a writer. I was 18. Sunglasses are better for your health. Number 92. In 2017, Stan Lee and his constant collaborator Jack Kirby were named Disney Legends for all of the characters they had created, specifically ones that were being used in the MCU. Number 93. Throughout his creative journey, Stan Lee, whether working independently or in collaboration, brought to life over 1,000 characters. Number 94. 
Stan Lee became a trademark in Marvel films with his iconic cameo appearances. He made notable appearances in various movies including Daredevil and the Iron Man films. Ultimately, he was featured in over 20 MCU films, TV series, and various Marvel adaptations. Number 95. With great sadness, on November 12, 2018, Stan Lee passed away at the age of 95. Number 96. Right after his death, fans, celebrities, and publishers from all over the world started mourning and paying tribute. Original Avengers actors took out a full page in The Hollywood Reporter dedicated to Stan Lee. Number 97. While DC Comics stands as one of Marvel's significant competitors, they've expressed their respect in various ways. For instance, a tangible tribute was made to Stan Lee at the real-life Superman statue in Metropolis, Illinois, where a black armband was added to commemorate his legacy. Number 98. Stan Lee even made a surprise cameo in a DC Comics film, Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Number 99. Stan Lee's final two cameos were filmed for Marvel Productions. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and Avengers Endgame, serving as a fitting farewell. Number 100. In 2021, Madame Tussauds, known for their hyper-realistic wax sculptures and their wax museum, revealed their Stan Lee wax sculpture. Number 101. In that very same year, New York gave tribute to Stan Lee, where a Bronx street, the same street where Stan grew up on, was co-named Stan Lee Way for the Marvel legend. And bonus fact, the upcoming Stan Lee universe from Cartoon Studios will celebrate and share Stan's treasure trove of post-Marvel creations with the world, so fans can continue to enjoy his characters and stories for years to come. As we wrap up this journey through the life and legacy of Stan Lee, we hope you've enjoyed these 101 fascinating facts about the man behind the Marvel magic. From his humble beginnings to becoming an icon, Stan's story is one of inspiration and creativity. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, share with fellow Marvel enthusiasts, and subscribe for more content on the incredible world of comics. Excelsior! Until next time, true believers.